Welcome to Tales from SYL Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion, and I'm Bill Stone. While I have your attention, I'd like to ask that if you like what I'm doing, please like this video, subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, share me on social media, and tell all of your friends, family, neighbors, pets, and livestock to do the same. I'd appreciate your support via my PayPal tip jar, my subscribe star, my merch store on Teespring, or a place on my website where you can support me further. And there are links to all of these in my description box. Support for the Green New Deal continues to worry me. The problem, as I see it, is that most of its supporters come from major metro areas. They see how the Green New Deal might benefit themselves, but they don't understand its larger impact. The majority of that impact would be on the United States agricultural output. One must understand that America's farmers and ranchers feed not only the United States, but also the entire world. Without the current level of agricultural productivity, it is not hyperbole to say that a billion people or more would starve to death worldwide. Now, Tales from SYL Ranch is rather explicitly not based in one of America's large metro areas. It's based in Lincoln, Nebraska which is a metro area of about 355 million people, sorry, 355,000 people, and that is about a half an hour's drive away from Omaha, Nebraska, which is a metro area of about 1 million. And furthermore, while I spent my 40-year career in information technology, I have an agricultural background. From ages 5 to 15, I spent anywhere from two weeks to a month on my grandparents working cattle ranch in rural South Dakota and I also have family members who are still in that field and while this doesn't qualify me as an agricultural expert it does at least give me a grounding in that field that people in metro areas just don't have I've previously not discussed the impact of Green New Deal on agriculture because it is a difficult show explaining the issue to urbanites involves a great deal of education and I must also overcome the entirely inaccurate perception urbanites have of modern agriculture. So if you're an urbanite watching my show, which is statistically likely, I'd ask that you allow yourself to unlearn what you have learned. Modern farmers and ranchers often tend tracts of land that are larger than either the New York City or Los Angeles metro areas. Doing this requires modern science which is why most of them have degrees in agricultural science and or agricultural engineering. That's right, those who live in rural areas aren't uneducated. Most hold bachelor's degrees that required the same breadth of subjects as would be required by any other bachelor's degree. Much of modern agricultural science requires operation of heavy equipment as this is really the only possible way to tend to tracts of land that large. This equipment is universally diesel powered. Due to the remoteness of much of the agricultural land, farmers and ranchers maintain their own large supply of diesel fuel on site. And they generally work from dawn until dusk, as the sun is about the only source of illumination. This is really the only way that's possible to have our current agricultural output, which literally and not figuratively feeds more than a billion people worldwide. Sun up to sundown with diesel powered equipment. Moving to electrically powered equipment would in introduce a fantastic amount of downtime. Where they currently work eight to 10, maybe even 12 hours per day without interruption, Electrically powered vehicles would require frequent and lengthy breaks in order to recharge these vehicles. It would reduce average working time to four to six hours, possibly less. It would also decrease the ability to care for the thousands of cattle in a rancher's care. Half of their population might well starve. And this assumes that creating the heavy equipment that is electrically powered is even possible. At present, no such equipment really exists except for a very small number. None are really on the drawing board, nor have the ones that are there been tested in real world environments. There are a couple of electric tractors on the market, but tractors are a tiny minority of the equipment used by modern agriculture, as we can see in the slideshow. Additionally, as with all other electric vehicles, they are massively more expensive than their diesel counterparts. 
There's also an issue of electricity availability. Unlike urban areas where electricity is ubiquitous and any power outages are usually brief, the remoteness of many agricultural areas means that a disruption of the electricity may mean that the power is out for days or even weeks, depending on the weather. While this definitely would cause even more downtime while the farmer or rancher waited around for power to be restored. In terms of cattle ranching specifically, which is what I know most about, the Green New Deal would also disrupt the entire food supply chain. There are no railways within a reasonable distance to most ranches. Building this network of railways necessary to serve them would be a feat of engineering never before undertaken. It would be a vast network crisscrossing hundreds of thousands of miles throughout the United States. Now, to understand how this really screws up the uh, food supply chain, you have to understand how cattle and meat come to your table. Now, at present, meat is produced in multiple stages. The first is what's called a cow-calf operation, which is what my grandparents had, in which cattle are bred by ranchers and allowed to essentially free-range graze for several years. After this, they are transported to auction houses by the millions via diesel-powered semi-trucks. And after they're sold, they're transported via diesel-powered semi-trucks to feedlots where they don't graze but are rather fed feed grains. This is because consumers don't like the taste of free-range cattle. The fact that they only ever eat grass makes them feel kind of tasteless and stringy. The feed grains alter their muscle, muscle tissue to be more like what consumers want to eat. So after a year or so at the feedlot, they are then transported back to the auction houses via diesel-powered semi-trucks where they're sold to meat processing wholesalers. After that, they are transported via diesel-powered trucks to processing facilities where they are slaughtered and turned into the sorts of meat that you'll find in your grocery store. These processing plants are largely electric, powered by multiple on-site generators. After processing, meat is then transported via diesel trucks to wholesalers who package and then store them in freezer facilities. The temperature of these freezers, by the way, is anywhere between negative 20 and negative 30 degrees Fahrenheit. And they're typically electrically powered as well via multiple on-site generators. And after that, on demand, the meat is transported via diesel trucks to the grocery stores. Now, on demand means that your local grocery store only keeps about three days' supply on hand to service normal customer operations. Modern grocery stores simply don't have the necessary freezer capacity to hold much more than this. Modern IT allows them to order as necessary, which means the grocery store is much more efficient. They can keep only what's necessary on hand rather than having too much inventory, which will spoil, or too little inventory, which won't service customer demand. So as you can see, diesel-powered vehicles are operated throughout. And again, a railway network would be a vast engineering undertaking that has never before been attempted. It would no doubt cost trillions of dollars to create, although no one has ever done such an estimate. No estimate has ever been made because few of those in government understand modern agricultural science. They have a view of agriculture that is propagated by TV and movies, and this isn't even remotely close to reality as I've just described. So not only do electric vehicles cut productivity on the ranch by reducing the number of hours that it's possible to work, it also reduces the ability to move the animals through the supply chain. A few electric semi-trucks do exist, but these have never been tested in the field and, as with all electric vehicles, massively more expensive than their diesel counterparts. This map represents the route taken from where my grandparents' ranch used to be to the auction house across the state of South Dakota. Now, this is about 400 miles, that blue line that you're seeing there. Now, for purposes of scale, I have included both the New York and Los Angeles metro areas, and they're shown on the right. They sort of stick out because they don't look anything like the white surrounding them. It's hard to see in this picture, but I positioned them above Sioux Falls, South Dakota, whose metro area is about 266,000. And, you know, oddly enough, that city, Sioux Falls, has roughly the same geographic area as either New York or Los Angeles. The difference, of course, is that it's less densely populated. 
Now, I would point out that the first 40 miles of this route, which is a good chunk of that vertical section on the left, uh, is that leads from where the ranch used to be to Wall, South Dakota, is a gravel road that isn't well maintained. It is essentially a uh, lane and a half gravel. It's graded by the county from time to time, but it's nothing like a paved road. And it's unknown whether an electric semi-truck could traverse this area, nor whether such a truck could carry the necessary weight. An average cow can weigh 1,800 pounds to a ton, so the truck must be capable of carrying as much as 50 to 100 tons. And again, no rail system, which would be incredibly vast, covering hundreds of thousands of miles throughout the United States, it doesn't exist. There is simply no substitute for diesel vehicles if you want to maintain current agricultural productivity. Without diesel, agricultural productivity would be cut at least 75%. This would lead to the mass starvation throughout the world of at least a billion people, including Americans. So, that's all I have to say about that. I'd love to keep the conversation going, so please leave your comments, questions, and nasty remarks, and I'll do my best to respond to you. So thanks for watching. That's all the time that we have today for this episode of the highly acclaimed, world-renowned Tales from SYL Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing the control and manipulation of minds.